Gill and Crime Files, together with other true crime and other noted content, including documentaries and very current elevated films, are now currently migrating worldwide on main TV platforms. So for the viewers out there, I have to ask the question, under such intense, high pressure circumstances, you know, you could, you, your life could be taken at any minute. How do you deal with it? You deal with it. You don't think of it. You don't have time to be worried because you're dealing with the situation that's in front of you. So you had a deal. Later on, you, it may have bothered you a little bit after you've come down and you're, you're, you're alone. But uh, during the situation, you learn to deal with it. You have no choice. You, your life is on the line. And it could be the life of others. So you, you have to you, be in a Lawrence Olivier a little bit, I guess. Yeah, and you've got to be, you know, quick of mind. You know, you've got to yeah. be quick yeah. in your feet. I mean, you'd step into this, you know, this kind of stuff. Because people would find this hard to believe, Ron. I mean, you know, I can understand. No, you were in a life, yes. You know, I can understand what it is to have to live a life of organized crime. You know, I mean, but um, so, but normal people, they wouldn't understand. They'd say, well, okay, I'm getting that. But why wouldn't you run away or take yourself out of that situation? Why would you persist to keep putting yourself in danger? What would you say to them, people? You don't know the answer to that. There is no answer because you, you just continue. That's all because to run away is never an answer. If you run away and try to hide, then you're going to be figured out anyway. So you have to live through it. You have to continue with what you've started. If you try to hide or put your head under the blankets, it, you're, you're going to surface eventually. So you can't do that. You have to work with it. It's a good question. And people would wonder that. Uh, thank you for the answer. <laughs> so you was, you was very, um, you see, because it's living with this stuff day in, day out. Yeah. Were there times that you really thought the game was up, Mark? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. There were a, a number of occasions where I thought the game was up. But you learn to live with it and you go on like nothing's wrong. If you start acting like something's wrong, it, 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 you know, it's like a dog smelling fear. They're going to know. So you go, ah, that's a bunch of garbage. Stop it. I don't want to hear that stuff. Yeah. So you would... You've got to be tough yourself, too. You just can't be a... You can't cower in a corner. You got to yeah. be just as tough as they are. Yeah. If you're not just as tough as they are, then they're going to see through you. Tougher, tougher even. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's an old quote. I think it says. I had a guy that wanted to frisk me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I had a guy that wanted to frisk me, and I had a body recorder on me, and uh, that part of the tape came out clear. He he was this guy was a real shooter too. I mean, this guy was a nasty guy, and he wanted to frisk me. And I says, you should be ashamed of yourself. How dare you talk to me like that? Then he, he finally, I, you know, I was just as tough as he was. He says, well, out of respect for your father, I won't do it. That yeah. part of the tape came out real clear. <laughs> Very close. I mean, in them situations, yeah. you know, it takes a lot of a lot of strength, a lot yeah, of nerve. A lot of gayons. So tell, tell us about another, another, another example where you come that close for your cover, uh, cover to be blown and certain death from. Yeah, when I went back, uh, yeah, my cover was blown the next time. You know, my cover was blown and that's when it got tough on me, when my cover was blown. But uh, getting before that, let's see, those were two occasions uh, that it really bothered me. A third one was with Jack Kemp. Jack Kemp was the, who ran for vice president of the United States, and I were pretty close. And uh, what happened is during the trial, I was charged with uh, a couple of others on setting up a minority company. Now, I was a front for Sammy Pieri, who was a mobster. And I actually had to go meet with the judge in advance. This is a bizarre story where I had to meet with the federal judge and he says, what happens if you're tossed out of the case? I said, I can't. The flags go up. They'll know who I am if I'm tossed out of the case. I unfortunately have to go through this judge. My life's on the line. He says, well, I don't know if I can do that and things like that. I called Jack Kemp. I says, this is a problem I have, Jack. 
And he said, well, Ronnie, I can't help you, you know, on something like that. And then I started thinking, you know, Jack had some ties, but not strong enough. I mean, he had ties through his office if he kept it later on. I didn't know of his ties until later on. And, and he did keep it quiet. And eventually the judge admitted to the fact that he did meet with me in advance over this because I told him I cannot be, I have to go through the trial. I literally have to go through the trial, even though I'm not part of it. I have to go through it. And of course, it was a hung jury. And uh, uh, later on, it came out, you know, that I had talked to the judge. So what was that time, that moment after 17 years undercover that your cover was blown? What actually happened or what transpired? Well, we had a U.S. attorney that was connected to the mob. He had a lot of mob connections. I wrote about it. And when he became U.S. attorney, I wrote the bureau. I met with the bureau on a number of occasions. I have a problem with this guy, especially if you tell him who I am. And they had no choice, they said, because he's the U.S. attorney. They have to turn the information over. I even have audio tapes of one of the mobsters telling me that it didn't come from us. It came from them, meaning the Justice Department that you're a source. And then eventually a mobster told me through via his brother-in-law that I better get out of town. So that's when I left. And the Bureau picked me up right away. I mean, they didn't have a problem. And uh, that, that's when I joined, the, that's when I went on the payroll. So they had a, what, there was some kind of code for this if your cover's blown and they picked yeah. you up? Is there some kind of process for this? Uh, no, it's not a process. I was talking with them on the phone and they said, just come on, we're going to meet you at such and such a place. They put me in a private area that uh, I don't want to get into that stuff, you know, the process that we go through. But uh, they put me under wraps, let's put it that way, for a while. And Did made sure I had to... Like a debrief? You had some kind of a debrief? Well, I went through a lot of debriefings all my life, but I went through more at this stage. Uh and, and uh, now we started preparing to bring some of these matters to court, the Labor's International Union, things like that. Now that I surfaced, the Bureau was always good to me in that sense. I cannot say, it, it, you know, two things I could say. The Bureau never asked me to lie. Never, never, you know, it, you know, you, it's, you know what happens with informants a lot of times. They're told that, listen, you want to get out of jail, the more you give us, the better deal you're going to get. And I would explain to them, don't do that, because that's going to lead them to exaggerate and not tell the truth. And I've seen that a lot. Don't do that. You know, you stay with the truth. So where was the CIA at this point when you had come out of the life, your cover was blown, you know, and the FBI, your your handlers, I'm guessing, they, they was you was there with them. Was the CIA in the picture there? Not at that time. They were out of it for a while, and they came back later on. Why uh, did they come back then? So well, that was because of a friendship I developed with a number of case officers uh, in the Bureau. I mean, in the CIA, you know, like case agents. And, uh, you know, Jack Platt, for one, there's others that... Uh, Dick Stoltz. I was one of Dick Stoltz's boys. He was pretty big in the CIA at that time. You know, early on, he had ran that one operation I was involved in. And we became pretty close. And uh, eventually, that's what led me to Williamsburg was Dick Stoltz. Because he had lived down here at that time. He's dead now. But Jack and I were close. And uh, that's when I started getting involved in... Uh, you know, a mix of overseas operations. I would speak in front of, I would lecture at classes at the FBI and the CIA. I would go to different places and lecture on, on uh, undercover work, how to do things, as well as the various activity. I even went to for Russian classes. I was speaking in front of Russian classes uh, at the academy, the FBI academy. I was at the academy on a regular basis. I did that on and off for yeah. three years. Look, I know you've lectured at Quantico, you know, on many occasions. Yeah. You know, yeah. you've lectured there, right, as an expert. Now, I want to go back a little bit because I'm, you know, for the viewers, I'm just trying to get chronological sure. kind of anchor here of when you was in the life. This would have been around the time that, you know, in 
uh, say the Gambino family, for instance, you know, you had Paul Castellano was boss and guys like this around that time. Is that correct? Yeah, that's early before I surfaced. Yes, he was there. And uh, I mean, I knew a lot of Gambinos, the Giardinas, Local 23, as well as others. I, I knew Joe and Gallo. Uh, it was quite a Joe Piney and Moan. I knew quite a few of them, and we would get together with them, with the Tadaros. If it were the Pieris, we'd get together with the Genovese's. And, you know, I knew Ponte from Ponte Street. I could go on and on with the people I, you know, I, I knew. So, did, you know, was there any kind of, you know, we know what happened to Castellano with... Yeah, um, with Tommy, Bellotti, yeah Tommy Bellotti. Sparks, yeah, Tommy Bellotti. So, did you hear anything about this, about murders? I guess you'd be hearing about the murders all the time in the grapevine while you were still undercover, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, no, I've, I've heard of murders, but not those particular murders. I didn't know about those. If I was aware of something coming up, I would tell the Bureau. The Bureau was more the one that would handle that. That definitely wasn't CIA. But uh, I didn't know about Bellotti or, or the or the Castellano killing. That was news to me. I didn't know. I, I know that we had a deal with the two Gs when we did work in there. I was working on New York City uh, uh, with the... Uh, an asbestos removal contract and the two G's were involved Gotti Giganti, that's what they were referred to them as and you had to use all mob companies I had to pay kickbacks and uh, which were you know, recorded by the Bureau and, and uh, led to the conviction of a number of Genovese people with the Mason Tenders Union and others there were quite a few in fact that were convicted yeah uh, Carmine uh, Giganti, of course, is a, a massive, massive name. You, you know, he, he was assassinated in, uh, in in Brooklyn. You know, in the so yeah. you know he was involved in a lot of the heroin trafficking. There was the you know the pizza connection case with the with the. Well, the, I, I knew one person in the piece of pizza connection, and he was from our area. I knew him, and I can't think of his name offhand, but he was involved in the transfer that. They were moving it through bricks, you know, con construction equipment, things like that as well, not just, you know, other areas. So they were doing quite a lot of it. Yeah, this was a massive thing. I mean, at that time, um, I think the Sicilian Mafia was uh, responsible for about 80 percent of the, of the heroin traffic, certainly into the United States. Now, I'm just asking you that one there, Ronald, because around that time, you know, and you would have been aware of of. Uh, a lot of this activity. Did you ever come close to Gigante? No, no, I never met Chin Gigante. Uh, uh, I don't think so anyway. No, I, you know, I was uh, close to a lot of the people, the cop was underneath him that answered directly and uh, Jimmy Marsala and all those people, but uh, I didn't know uh, Chin, I didn't know John Gotti. I mean, I never met John Gotti. Uh, the people I knew were actually loyal to Castellano. They weren't loyal to him. You know, Joe Piney would have never approved, Armand would have never approved that. He was not that type of person. I just can't believe but That's who John Gotti answered to. Uh, so I think it was just a, a renegade hit when they went and did this without the approval of the family. It seems, it seems so. I mean, I've talked to, you know, I've talked to guys who was in that, who was in that inner circle at that time, and they've shed a lot of light, you know, on what was going on there. I mean, the chin after I mean, put put the hit on Gotti for. Yes, that's true. In fact, you know, I was told by the bureau and uh, 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 to see so, you know, to see so was uh, was blown up in the car. That was meant for John Gotti, but that come from that come from the chin. Now they say they say with the chin, he was certainly the most one of the most cleverest old school dons of the time. What would you say to that? Well, he walked down Sullivan Street. They called him the Robe, so he was <laughs> he was faking his illness, uh, and he, it got to the point that he probably really was ill a little bit. I, I believe he was possibly a little off. Off balance, and but that's not how the Genovese family operated. There were many people in the Genovese family that run runs things. To this day, I really don't know how the Genovese family operates. There's no one head. I mean, you had Barney Belomo on the rise. 
Uh, I mean, you had Salerno as a front man. I mean, there were a number of them. Uh, I, I recall when my father had to go in front of the commission, it was Tommy Eboli that was the spokesman for the Genovese family. And it doesn't mean that they were the head. It's like Chicago. Accardo was always there behind the scenes. Yet you see Gianciana, you see Sammy Wings Carlisi, you see all the, but, but I know Tony Accardo was always the dominant presence. So they put people in a different position. So it's hard to determine who really, you know, was the head, who's the front man, things of that nature. Yeah, I interviewed Mike, Michael Francis, you know, and I asked him yeah. the same question about the gym, you know, and he gave me an interesting answer as well. I mean, it has to be said that, that the chin was certainly the last of the main five uh, uh, heads, as it were, that, you know, was taken off the street, you know. So he had a, he played the game, right? Did you did yeah. you ever know Sonny, Sonny Francis and, and Michael? I think I knew Sonny. I didn't know Michael. I knew Sonny, though. I, I, I had talked to Sonny, but that I don't recall anything about it, except when I seen his face, I recognized it. A lot of these people would would preach you, and we'd go out to dinner and that. You just don't remember everybody's name. You can remember a face, but you can't, because there were so many of them. Uh, we were always out to dinner uh, with the Columbos. Like, like I said, Joe Colombo was at our house. We were out to dinner with the Genovese family. I mean, there, there were so many of us. Uh, the Lucchese, uh, there were a number of them, too. Uh but you went on. The Bananos, I didn't really know. My father knew the Bananos. Them, I'd never really got to know. In fact, that's why there was going to be a hit in Buffalo, because uh, John, this John Camilleri agreed with, uh, and my father went along with them to, to bring Joe Bonanno into the Buffalo family. And that's what caused the hit on John Camilleri. Uh, he was killed because he was going to go switch with the Bananos. And my father was scheduled to be hit that night. Uh, but out of, you know, they, 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 there were two different stories. Sammy Perry is the one that told me, I saved your father's life because I don't want anything happening to you. He wanted me. They were grooming me uh, for higher things. He wanted me made. Sammy was well known. He was always tied with the Genovese family. He was tied with Cleveland. He introduced me to the whole Cleveland family, New York City. And it was through him that I, I got to meet all the people. Uh, in New York and places like that. I, I, I would go on Broom Street to meet with different people, deliver messages for Sammy. Uh, you know, I ended up knowing more people than my father did, <laughs> which is hard to say. I mean, it's fascinating. It really is. You know, Nicole asked you, you know, the question is, how did you reconcile with your own self, with your own views, uh, how you're living this double life, how your father's living? Well, How did that go for you two as a father and son? Well, it's hard because my father, my father eventually knew I had talked with my father. We went through somewhat of a role reversal where I became more the telling you what to do instead of you telling me what to do type of role because I was upset. I said, Dad, you got to get out of this racket. You know that. I can't get out. You just don't get out. And what embarrassed me the most uh, was I got called to a meeting of the commission or the Buffalo family called to a private meeting. My father was not even allowed to sit in the room with us. You know, he had to sit in the other room because he was passe. You know, his day was over with. I didn't appreciate them treating my father, but that had not, it wasn't revenge or nothing like that. I had started long before this, uh, trying to, you know, do what I could to eradicate this, this cancer. Uh, but that, that was it too. I mean, a lot of it was, I didn't like them. I didn't like what they stood for. You're bringing innocent people down. I just seen too many workers, too many people that were victims. And people don't realize they're victims. That's the thing. They don't realize they're victims. They say, well, this job is better than, you know, of course they could have been elevated, not that they realize, you know, I'm, I'm happy just to have my job. Uh, and I don't want to make that. I, I don't want to you know, cause waves or, you know, disturb what's going on. People don't realize what an evil's there. You have to do something about it. Because it's your money they're stealing. I mean, these people are partying down in uh, Cancun, Mexico, uh, in the Caribbean, wherever you want, on these members' money. And they're bringing their family. They're living in the, the finest hotels, eating the finest meals, flying first class. I mean, you're supposed to be a union official. 
That's how you treat your workers. You don't do that. So this, this corruption, you know, this corruption that was very, very inherent, you know, and I know you was very, very keen in the unions back in the day, as we said. How do you think it is today, Ron? It's still there, but it's smarter. They, we, uh, they've changed. They've mutated. They know to be public about something is to find a cold jail. Uh, to pull a Gotti is to find a cold jail, as we used to like to say. So uh, they're smarter about it. They they work in healthcare business. They right now with the COVID nineteen, they're making a fortune. This is the biggest thing that could have happened to them. They do everything from delivering the medicine, uh, Uber drivers, whatever you have. I'm not just saying Uber, but they they make sure they're in the chain to deliver things. Taxi drivers. They're all they're making all kinds of money. They're making money off of the hospitals. They make money off of the, uh, creating software for the hospitals. Now, by creating the software, they know the hospitals' prices. As a result, they have access to those prices. They can even for the smallest medicine bottle, they know the prices. And all you have to do is bid under what they have, and you have the contract. Then later on, once you're locked in, you can raise the prices and raise the price elevate. Yeah. Premium yeah. price. Now, so thanks for that because it gives it, it gives a you know a kind of an idea to the audience of what was happening, and some of the um, iconic names of the day. Then, so when you when your cover was blown, you know you've you know gone to your hand of the FBI. So where did that leave you then? What was what was next for you, Ron? Well, the hard thing was moving away from my family. You know, seeing my kids, uh, my ex-wife said she had a gun, she'd blow my brains out. So it wasn't as hard from her because her father was connected to the mob. Uh, not that I blame her, I don't. She was a good woman. Uh, but, you know, it was the mentality at the time. Uh, so I started living a, a, a life, uh, living in different areas, meeting with FBI agents, traveling to the academy on a regular basis and working on new matters, as well as developing the matters that we had in front of us. So it was a constant. I was working constantly for the FBI. And you as, you as, well, you joined, I mean, what was your role? Well, I, were, I, I, I was, I, I could have, but I, I could have been, but I worked as <laughs> under contract. I was, at this time, I was, what you call a contract. I worked under contract for the FBI as well as I did for the CIA. I never became an officer in the CIA or an agent in the Bureau. I just worked under contract and, and I was paid well. You know, they pay you well, but you have you have to work. It's like anything, it's a, you, you have a job. You have to be up at a certain time, you know, and be at a certain place at a certain time. And and you did that. It, it was constant. It, you know, I, I would say it's about 50 hours a week I work. I mean, I'm guessing, you know, there's certain operations because, you know, this borders on kind of black ops. I mean, you know, you're yeah. in the business. I mean, some stuff I can't get into. Yeah, uh, but tell us, give, give us an idea what you can, Ronald, about something. Well, that, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, what one of the areas I got into, I mean, with the CIA you're talking about and the FBI overseas. Are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Now, one of one of the areas I got into was the spy swap. I knew Anna Chapman, the Russian girl, and I didn't know that when I met her, it was out of liquor. One of my uh, businesses was uh, importing uh, vodka from uh, Eastern Europe, uh, from Belarus, and she uh, ended up getting a hold of me and wanted to import our vodka into London or into the UK. So I met with her in London. And uh, little did I know that she's looking at me, not that I'm looking at her. I didn't know she was working for the Russian government. This was all news to me. Uh, at that time, I had to be careful in London because Boris Berezovsky and I did not get along. I had my problems with Boris. He had a Boris the Builder. He was in London. They eventually found him hung. And I had developed a relationship with the Putin administration and the Belarusian uh, government, I, uh, and the Ukraine. I mean, I was close to many of the European countries or Eastern European countries. And uh, and and, and uh, Boris Berezovsky had caused a lot of problems. Uh, and this is during the Yeltsin era. Yeltsin had agreed to give him uh, the rights to uh, what we called Soyuz Plod, 
of Plato import. That was the export of Stolichina vodka, uh, Rus Ruskaya had another vodka that they had, Muskovskaya, Ma Moscow. Uh, Stolichina means on the capital. And so he took the rights and he gave them to a Yuri Sh uh, Schiffler. They moved, uh, so now in the, uh, after that, they started taking control of it and they moved it offshore. And uh, they started uh, manufacturing it in Riga, Latvia. That's where Stolichin is made today. And as a result, I was working you know, with friends of mine, Timothy Borden and other people that were in the trade business. We decided to get it back. And this is true. I mean, this is, this is uh, how I ended up getting close to him. And I, uh, you, uh, we went through the Stolichin of vodka and uh, found out that... Uh, he did, and, and, and Boris Berezovsky was the power behind him. So it slipped it through Yeltsin's hands. And they were selling it all over here in the United States, the UK, and all that is this Russian-made vodka. In reality, it's made in uh, Riga, Latvia. And the Russians wanted it back, and they couldn't get it back. So they came, you know, they worked with me, and I dealt with logging off from uh, the, the Soyuz Plot import. They, they, the Soyuz Plato import, you know, he was responsible for all of the, the, the vodka leaving the country and import. And, you know, here they had changed the name. So now they put it under Schiffler's name, but it was Boris Berezovsky. That led to a lot of the feud. I learned that the feud started one time with Putin. Putin called the meeting of what they referred to as the Sparrows Club. You had Abramowitz, Gajinsky, Berezovsky, Puterovit of Alpha Bank. They were all there. And in, and in the meeting, Putin had asked them to start helping a little bit, to give a little bit back to his government. Pyotr Avid agreed. The others did not. Pyotr Avid from Alpha Bank agreed, but the others did not. And Berezovsky was put on the outs. So he moved to London to get out of the way. And that's where he went. And, and uh, Schiffler, he moved out of the country, and he hangs around with, uh, well, what's his name, the actor, the young kid on his boat. He's got one of the largest, largest yachts in the world. He has uh, DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo DiCaprio, yeah. Yeah, so Schiffler moved out. He's doing fantastic. <laughs> and Russia got, you know, they, they had... They got screwed up. And at that time, we were developed. Actually, it was a matter of developing good relationships. We were not looking at a bad relationship. We were looking to develop a relationship where we had friendship on either side. This was our objective, that we worked together. We had more in common than we had that, that was that, that would have been against us. And, and that's what we were doing. And so we had developed good relationships. You were open about it. But the thing is, I found out that uh, what I met with the vodka, we went up to, uh, uh, I can't recall the name of it, but that handled Cristal vodka and all the various things. And we met in their office and we were escorted by the Russian mafia. And we had a military escort. Here we have the military taking us around, going up and down Tevskaya, which is the main drag in Moscow. And we had a military escort and there are a bunch of young kids. People think of the Russian mafia is is old no they're young kids with millions of dollars multi-million dollars and they had their different factions but you brought them together and you know at that time we also thought that we had putin leading leaning our way that he would come around and we to this day still feel a lot of us that it was a result of us shutting them down we, we had recommended that we bring russia into nato because it'd be better in, having them inside the tent you know, P and out that outside the tent P and in, uh, so to speak. And uh, but that was objected to. Then uh, the same happened with Belarus. We had an opportunity, we felt, to bring Belarus. And I worked with the International Red Cross to bring wheat, chenitsa, into uh, to Belarus. And they turned us down. It was during the Clinton administration. I'll never forget, I talked to one of Clinton's representatives, Silverstein or Saperstein. I can't recall his name. But I called him by the wrong name. He said, no, my name is so-and-so, and no, we're not going to help you. So that ended that. Here's a here's the thing. Let me come in and, you know, here's the thing there. That's fascinating, by the way, you know, the, you know, the intrigue of it all. And 
this stuff goes on every day of the week, every week of the year, every yeah. every every month, every year, right? And it's yeah. it's it's very underground, even more underground and more candlestein than the mafia, right? Yes. A lot of these yeah. things are intertwined and the arms dealing and wars and all this stuff. But here's a question. So if you're you're contracting for the CIA, you're contracting for the FBI. So, you know, are they running you towards Putin? I mean, these guys are really clever, especially Putin. You know, they know who they're dealing with, right?